Acts chapter 20 of the Bible, yes. So when I was 20 years old, I was a sophomore in college, and I found out I had to take this class. This class was called speech class, and I was so excited about it because I really liked talking. I liked talking in front of people especially, and these people had to listen to me. They couldn't walk away. They were graded on how they listened to me. It was so cool. My only problem was every time I spoke, someone always made the same criticism. Dude, slow down. So let me try that again. So when I was a sophomore in college, there was a prerequisite that we had to take speech class. And I didn't know how much I would love it, but I absolutely love standing in front of people and communicating. And one of the keys that they taught us in that class was to always read your audience. Look for eye contact. Are they listening? Do you have them? Are they giving head nods? At churches, well, old school churches, they would also do stuff like, mm, amen, stuff like that. But you're looking, are they with you? You need to know if they're coming along for the ride that you're talking about. And uh, one of the things I learned in that, as, as you process through, is you have to be able to read the audience. Today, looking at our text in, in chapter 20, the Apostle Paul never learned this. There's this moment where he's going in. It's the last time he's meeting with his people at the group at, 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 at church in, in Troas. And while he gets there, he, they meet for one last time. And they meet in the third story. So there's this open room. Whenever they had the first floor, usually that's where they lived. Second floor would have some extra rooms. The third floor was usually an open space. And so they had everyone in there. And he's talking. And what Paul did not understand is how to read the room. Because he kept going on and on and on. And he just kept speaking and speaking. And long about midnight, there was a young man. All we know is that his name was, he was young. And the man's name was Eutychus. And he was sitting in a windowsill. It was a good spot to be because you're getting some of the fresh air in a packed room. But as Paul went on and on and on, Eutychus got a little sleepy. Now the dangerous thing when you're sitting in a windowsill and Paul's going on and on and on, you may get a little bit tired. And sure enough, Eutychus falls asleep. And now sitting in a windowsill, he's got a 50-50 shot of whether he's going to fall inside the house or outside. And sure enough, he falls out of the building. Falls three stories to his death. Because Paul is going on and on. People are dying to get out of there. Some of you will get it on the ride home. People are dying. They stop the service. At least he's aware enough for that. He goes downstairs, prays over the kid. Eutychus gets up and he's alive. They bring him upstairs. And listen to this. Paul keeps preaching. From midnight to dawn, the dude keeps going on and on. And I'm like, man, take a speech class. You know something funny? It was the last time Paul was going to talk with him. And I'll tell you, if Pastor Paul had one last shot to talk to us, you can break all the clocks, and you can all put your phone away because we're just going to listen. You know what I mean? When you've got one last shot, it's when it's most important, and he's never going to see these people again. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he knows that trouble is there, and he's going to have one last dialogue with them. Hey, you and me, let's have this one last talk. And you ever had that where you realize the last words you say are often the most critical, they're the most important, and this is one of those moments. Right after this, he goes and he meets with another group, and it's the same situation. I don't have another shot at you. I want one last conversation. This is a special group that he's meeting with. In fact, um, you've heard us talk about this place a lot. Ephesus is the name of the church. It's, it's a town in what's current day Turkey. It's one of the key components of everything that's gone on in the New Testament. There's Jerusalem, which has a big church. And then Ephesus seems to be some sort of center of what's going on in the church world. In fact, uh, the book of Revelation has a component written about Ephesus. Paul himself writes a book to uh, Ephesus. It's called Ephesians. And then also, you may not know this, but the books of First and Second Timothy were written to the pastor of Ephesus. Timothy was the pastor of this group. And he's on his way to Jerusalem. He knows he's not going to come back this way again. And he says, we got to meet up. In fact, what they do is uh, Ephesus is up here on his way to Jerusalem, which is down over here. He stops over in Miletus. And while there, he says, hey, send for the elders of Ephesus. I want to have one last conversation. Final words critical things. Only what's most important you discuss when it's the end. You don't have talks about the weather and fantasy football when it's the last time you're with people. You only talk about what's most critical. And I want to look into some of those critical, critical, critical conversations that they had. The other thing that you're going to need, we, we know that Ephesus is going to be key here, but then also the Holy Spirit has been a key character in this story. When we were looking at the book of Acts and deciding that we were going to do a sermon series on the book of Acts, I thought that one of the key characters would be the Apostle Paul. 
And what I keep finding is that this underlying character that's far more critical than Paul is the Holy Spirit. I'll give you a little background on the Holy Spirit. The God that we serve is one God. We serve only one God. But we see him in three persons. There is God the Father, God the Son who is Jesus. He's the one who left heaven, came to earth for Christmas. He knew Christmas was coming and he came. See, get it? No. He came, lived a perfect life, and then died on the cross and rose again so that we can put our faith in him and he can come in and lead our lives. When that happens, we get the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit is the one that guides you and talks with you. When you're deciding whether or not to do this or this and you pray, give me clarity, and you hear that inner voice that you know is bigger and different than you and says, go that way, that's the Holy Spirit working in you. And you are going to see a lot of the Holy Spirit in this. So we're going to be in Acts 20. We're going to start in verse 18. Now this week I'm going to preach from a different translation. There are a number of different translations where they'll use slightly different phrasing. Today I'm going to use the CEV, uh, Contemporary English Version, not the NIV, which we normally come from, because there are some real things that bring clarity from this text um, in this version. I really, really appreciate it. So as we get started here, uh, let's go ahead and, and jump in, uh, starting at verse 18. So this is Paul talking and talking to the, the leaders of the church of Ephesus one last time. You know, everything I did during the time I was with you when I first came to Asia, some of the Jews plotted against me and caused me a lot of sorrow and trouble. But, okay, this is when you have contrast. That's what was going on, on the outside. But watch my character is what he's about to say. But I served the Lord and was humble. When I preached in public or taught in your homes, I didn't hold back from telling anything that would help you. Look at this. I didn't hold back. I told the Jews and the Gentiles to turn to God and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I had a mission. I had a mission from God, and the mission was a simple one. That Jesus Christ, who lived that perfect life and died and rose again, my job was to tell him about that grace that if you trust him, you can have this relationship with him. But I want you to see in that mission how he did it. He did it by an act of service. He saw himself and put himself below others. And the second thing that you'll see here is that he didn't hold back. If you look at this, one of these paragraphs that, that the Apostle Paul gives to this church that's saying, what really matters? What's critical? What's worth my last words here with you? Is that living the mission is totally worth it. When I was a kid, I had two dreams in my life. Two things that stirred in my heart. One of them is that one day I would grow up and play basketball at the University of Duke. The problem is I never grew up. I'm still, I'm still just five foot nothing. Also, I'm not good enough. Number two, and I think this is one of those dreams that echoes in the hearts of almost all of us at one point. At some point in your life, you have an inkling in your heart where you say, I want to be a part of something that drastically changes the world. I want to have a significant life. I don't want a life that simply, I went to work, I got my paycheck, and I went home, and then 60 years later, I retired, and then two days later, I died. I wanted to live something important, and I think that's true. That echoes out in the heart of everyone that God places on earth. You know, when I look at Paul, though, sometimes it's discouraging because I look at him, and he lived it at such a high level that I feel like I can't measure up. And I know we're not supposed to compare because you, someone always loses when you compare. But in my own little heart, I look at that and I say sometimes, man, I can't measure up to that. This guy traveled 10,000 miles without an airplane or a car or any type of motorized vehicle all over the world sharing Jesus. I live in Roseburg. No knock on Roseburg, Sutherland, Green, or South Umpqua. But I feel sometimes like I can't compete with him, and I can't, and I'm not supposed to. One of the things I've noticed about living a mission is they don't, you, you don't live a lifetime in one moment. And if you feel like you can't measure up, now, sometimes I do this with even Pastor Paul, I could never live up to that guy. And that's okay. Here's the heartbeat of living a mission. It takes one moment at a time. In fact, if you want to have an impact, start with the moment you're in right now. I was talking with Jason. Jason's the, the student ministries director in Green. He's about to become later today a student ministries pastor. And he was on stage and he shared his story about how he uh, had a background where he was addicted to, uh, to alcohol and to uh, marijuana. And when we were talking about this, this idea of living a life like that, he said, you know, it's the same thing. You don't, you don't live in recovery a lifetime at a time. You do it one moment at a time. In fact, when you say to someone who's at the beginning of recovery, you can't ever do it again the rest of your life, it feels overwhelming. And he says, you all, but you ask the question, can you go one hour without marijuana? Yeah, I can do an hour. 
And when you get done with that hour, you do the next one. If you want to live a life on mission, one thing you need to know, you will do it one moment at a time. Don't shoot for the stars. Just live this moment right now. The thing that I want you to see about this is look how it, he did it. I didn't hold anything back. And then watch what he says. From telling anything that would help you. Every aspect of living on the mission that Jesus Christ has for you includes other people. You cannot live a life of significance in isolation. If you were on your own, two things will happen. You will never impact anyone else. And number two, you will be stunted in your growth. There are two aspects about family church that I think are interesting in relationship to this. One of them is the value of a life group. Because it forces you out of just coming on a weekend, sitting in a chair and going. It puts you in relationship with people where you hear their heartbreak and you have to decide if you're going to care and lean in. And you have to share your heartbreak, which means they are allowed to lean in and be a part of it. The other thing that's interesting at Family Church, we do something else that I don't think helps that much. We do live stream, which gives us the opportunity to watch the sermon when our kids are sick. But often, it becomes a habit and we isolate ourselves from the life of others. Notice the life of Paul. It's never done in isolation. It's always done in community. But I'll give you a caution. If you're going to live in a relationship with people, here's a guarantee. They will hurt you. So if you're going to live a life on mission, you want to write this underneath because it's not on there for you. Forgiveness has to be a component in it. And if you can't forgive, you'll end up isolated. So number one, on his final conversation with the church of Ephesus, living a life on mission matters. Let's, let's move on, starting in uh, verse 20 here. I don't know what will happen to me in Jerusalem, but I must obey God's spirit and go there. In every city I visit, I am told by the Holy Spirit that I will be put in jail and in trouble in Jerusalem. This is so interesting. Everywhere he goes, either the Holy Spirit tells him or other people with the Holy Spirit talking to them, they tell him, if you go to Jerusalem, you're in trouble. But he says, but I must obey. But I don't care what happens to me as long as I finish the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to do. And that work is to tell the good news about God's great kindness. Look carefully at this. He says, I must obey God's spirit. This seems like a total duality. On one side, the Holy Spirit saying to him, you need to go to Jerusalem. The mission. Ah, yes, this is what's next. And simultaneously, the Holy Spirit is saying, when you go, you will suffer. He is getting a calling and a warning from the same source. That's just weird. Why would you, the Holy Spirit say, caution, and yet say, go? Because I think the Holy Spirit's perspective on pain the Holy Spirit's perspective on difficulty and suffering is different than mine. If I get a warning, it's not going to feel good. You know what I hear? Don't do it. Because you know what I like? I like coffee and I like comfort. And when I hear the Holy Spirit say, be careful, that's a scary thing. I think, okay, he's saying, don't do it. But here we have it at the exact same time. He's saying, I must obey and go there. But I circle the word must in your Bible. It's so critical, you have to do it. By the way, warning, it's going to be really, really, really bad. One, sometimes I think we, we play this out that if we ever hear a warning, we take it as a no instead of what it is, which is a warning. I'm going to play this in, in family church history and culture. When Todd Fink was the youth pastor here at the Sutherland campus many moons ago, he realized that family church had a real problem inside the youth group with selfishness. And he knew one of the aspects that would change that is if he picked them up, carried them into a van, and took them down across the border and took them to Mexico, and took them on a Mexico mission trip. And things began to change in the hearts of those students. Well, interestingly enough, over the course of time, we realized we didn't just have a selfish youth group. We had a selfish church. So we began taking people to, to down to Mexico. We would take family visits down there where we would go and serve. And it started to transform the way that we saw people outside of ourselves. We saw how selfish we were. And here's the, th the cool thing. We take a Mexico mission trip every year. And here is what is wrestled with every time. There is a stirring in a heart that says, <clears throat> we got to go. And simultaneously, they hear 
concerns about what it means to go. Let me tell you, that may be the Holy Spirit saying, yes, you don't have the money. Yes, there is a threat. Yes, you will not sleep well, and you will not sleep well. Yes, it's going to be hard, and no, you don't speak the language. Simultaneously, he could be saying, yeah, it's tough, and go. And if you listen to this part of the Holy Spirit's words and ignore these, you miss out. Because here's what I know of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to wrestle and struggle. He wants it to be hard because it's in the hard times that, he want, that we, we find growth. In fact, if you don't believe the, the Holy Spirit wants you to suffer, you don't believe he wants you to grow. So, last week was Commitment Sunday for Mexico. I talked with Craig and asked permission to say this. There are those of you who have been wrestling and you have been hearing the warning and you have been hearing the calling and you listened to the warning and ignored the calling and I'll say, mark on your card. If you would like to go, we'll have a spot for you. If you're wrestling, it's time to submit. Because here's what you're going to find. You have to come with this idea that when the Holy Spirit moves, it may come with some difficulty. It may come with some suffering. But the only answer when the Holy Spirit says go is yes, Lord. I'm in. I, uh, I think a, a really cool analogy of this is the idea of pedals on a bike. Because this is how spiritual growth works. When the Holy Spirit moves in your life, you gain momentum. You start rolling. And my hope is always that he starts it rolling. He's on one side of the pedal and I'm on the other. He starts it rolling and then we're just downhill until heaven. That's what I want. But here's how it works. He presses down on the pedal and we start rolling. And the question is, do I obey on my part? Because this is how momentum, sustained momentum works. He speaks and I submit. He speaks and I go. He warns and I go. I'll tell you though, this listening to the Holy Spirit's not easy. Because remember that thing about relationship? What happens when there's conflict? This last Tuesday, not Tuesday 1988, but this Tuesday, I had to wrestle with this. We had a meeting where we were talking about things. It was a five hour long meeting. And in the course of the meeting, you have a lot of people and you have a lot of opinions, which means if you have a lot of opinions, you're going to ruffle feathers and back and forth. And this happens. Well, after the meeting, we had the meeting after the meeting which is the meeting between me and the one guy where we offended each other and we had to make it right. And in the course of that, we shared things about our frustrations with each other. And it wasn't in that churchy, thou art a pain. <laughs> it was real. And at the end of it, he walked out to my right and I walked out to the left and I heard the Holy Spirit in my life say, pray with him. And I said, no, you pray for him. This is hard. And don't sugarcoat this. This is an everyday life. This is why relationships are so critical because that's where you play out what God calls you to. I walked out saying no, saying no, saying no, got in the car and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to work with this. Because when the Holy Spirit moves and you refuse, that's where you stay. And he may come around again and say, move is this where y'all stay? And I, you've had these moments. Maybe you've had that moment where God said you need to go make it right or you need to forgive or you need to let this go. And you say no. There is stagnation in your spiritual journey until you say yes, Lord. So I texted him later that night and said, man, I was wrong. And then the next two, Thursday when we met together again, this time I said, can I pray? And I prayed for our relationship. Obedience is so critical. Whether it's hard or not. And I'll say, nothing stops us more than our view of suffering. And when our view is to say, the goal of being a follower of Jesus is that everything is pretty and nice, like a Christmas card. It may be pretty, but it ain't real. So the first thing that we see is the idea of living on mission with community with other people. And the second thing is this idea that I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit and do what it says how do you respond to difficulty? Underneath that, I want you to write the word Holy Spirit. The next aspect of this, he moves from the idea of his mission and then the idea of whether or not they're going to listen to what God's going to do in their life as, as he challenges them. The, second, or the third part of this, he goes on to say, I have gone from place to place preaching about God's kingdom, but now I know that none of you will ever see me again. This is our final dialogue. 
I tell you today that I am no longer responsible for any of you. I love the, ex the exclamation point there. It's not on me anymore. I hand it off. It's on you. I have told you everything God wants you to know. Look after yourselves and everyone to the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be like shepherds to God's church. It is the flock that, the, that he bought with the blood of his own son. A couple of things that stand out. Number one, he's no longer responsible for them. Over the course of time, he has helped them, guide them in their spiritual journey. We like to call it scaffolding. He's come alongside them. But now he, his hands are off. They're going to have to ride the bike on their own. You ever have the moment when you're learning to ride your bike? I've never heard of anyone not have the bike learning moment where someone else wasn't holding it with them. Paul has been running alongside, holding the bike, and now he's letting go. You're riding on your own. I remember when I was learning to ride the bike, I was riding along, riding along, and my dad was holding on to the back end, and he let go and says, you're doing it, you're doing it, you're doing it. I freaked out, turned to the left, hit the curb. He was still close enough behind me to flip over me and land smack face first into the curb. It was the most painful time, well, not for me, but it was the most painful bike riding lesson of all time. The Apostle Paul has been running alongside them, and now it's time to let go. It's on you. But there's something else in here that I think is so critical. He says, no longer am I responsible. You must look after yourselves. Think about this. You are responsible for your own spiritual journey. And if you are still here thinking that Pastor Paul is the one that will guide you and keep you, he'll be alongside, that may be true. But you are responsible for whether or not you grow in your journey. You know, when that Holy Spirit presses down on the pedal, Paul can't push it forward for you. It's on you. But look at what it says beyond that. It says, look after yourselves and everyone the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Now, this is a radical thought. This is no longer just you and your spiritual journey. He's saying you are now responsible for your own bike riding. And you are responsible to help other people learn how to follow Jesus. So the next part on there, you can write this on your outline. The idea of taking responsibility. You see that it comes out in two areas. It comes out with ourselves and it comes out with others so as you look through this, I want to show you uh, our spiritual pathway that we have here at Family Church. Just a quick explanation. This is a, a picture of a seeker, someone who does not yet know about the goodness of Jesus Christ. And then after they have made a choice to become a follower of Jesus, they become a student who is learning about the goodness of God. And as they grow in that knowledge, they start seeing other people's needs and they start becoming a servant. They start caring for others. And as they move along, their heart becomes fully devoted to God. They become a steward who shepherds and cares for what I've noticed about this is the people who are new to Christ, they need a lot more scaffolding. They need someone to come alongside them. That's what these people have been. Paul has been running alongside them, and now he's letting go. One of the ways you will be able to tell how much movement's happening in your spiritual journey, when you have moved from a student to a servant, is that moment when you start seeing and caring for others. So as you are contemplating about your responsibility in your spiritual journey, here's the echo out of it. When you look around your life, how many other people are you impacting that need to know Jesus or are young in their faith and need you to come alongside them, that need the encouragement of what God has done in your life? If you don't see anyone that relies on you, that some component of you, that means you're still stuck here. You may be a follower of Jesus who has been a part of a church for 20 years. You may know all of the words, but at the, at the, at the end of the day, the mark of someone moving from a student to a servant is whether or not they serve. It's whether or not they see other people. If it's still all about you, you are stuck. So I want to play this out again. So the movement from student to servant is how you interact with others. Everyone the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. You are responsible for them. We have a mission here at, at Family Church. We want everyone to find and follow Jesus. This burns in my heart. That when I see my neighbor and when I see the people at, at my children's school and when we're doing little league baseball with the kids and we see all the parents, I want every one of them to fall in love with Jesus. But this right here is a great mission. But this is not Family Church's full mission. It's only part of it. The other part relates to this last thing about everyone taking responsibility. Our heart is that people would help people find and follow Jesus. 
for far too long, and maybe this is an American church thing. I've only ever been a part of American church and then one week in Mexico, so I don't have a global perspective. But my observation of the church is the expectation is that the spiritual momentum of the church and the movement for people finding and following Jesus is all placed on a pastor. And we want to take that off. So here's what we're doing. We're passing the buck. It's all on you. I'm taking the rest of the day off. Not really. It's on people helping people. And here's what's so cool about that. Pastor Paul does not live your life. He does not live in your home. He does not work where you work. Only you are there. And if your hope and your goal is to somehow get him in proximity of Paul so that Paul will lead him to Christ, you are missing your part in it. Remember, if you're going to live in a mission that God calls you to, it's going to be in connection with people. And you are the only one living your life. No one else can do it for you. Our heartbeat that you would be people who are helping other people find and follow Jesus. The last paragraph is he's finishing up with these beloved people that he's poured into for so long. I know that after I'm gone, others will come like fierce wolves and attack you. Some of your own people will tell lies to win over the Lord's followers. Be on your guard. Remember how day and night for three years I kept warning you with tears in my eyes. That first part I think is so fascinating here. As he's looking at guarding the team. The first thing he talks about are these fierce wolves that will come from the outside. What's so interesting about that is this apostle Paul, the leader of the church, is fully aware of what those people are like. Do you know why? Because he was one of them. In fact, the beginning of the story, at the beginning of Acts, a little review for you, his name wasn't Paul. It was Saul. And he was a devoted follower of what he thought was, was God, but he hated Jesus and he hated the church. He was a part of a group called the Sanhedrin. Uh, the subsect of that, he was a Pharisee, which meant he was all about the law. And he thought Jesus was a sham. His goal was to destroy the church. In fact, the first man martyred after Jesus rose from the dead, his name was Stephen. He was a man that we know was full of the Holy Spirit. He was humble. He was a servant. And he stood up before the Sanhedrin and said, you want to know what the truth is? The truth is that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died by your hand and he rose to life. And they said, kill him. And they took him out to stone him. Not the current way, the old-fashioned way, which meant they put him outside the city and they took rocks and they threw it at him until he was dead. And Saul was the leader of it who was holding the coats, lending approval. And after this, he went through the whole city of Jerusalem, rounding up the Christians, trying to destroy the church. Who? Oh, the leader of the church we're talking about. His background is in church killing. Finally, on the way to Damascus, where he was going to go kill the, and destroy the church up there, Jesus stopped him on the road and said, Hey, dude, slow down. i got something better for you. In fact, let me tell you who I am. I'm the one you're trying to kill. I lived a perfect life. I died on the cross, rose again. Everything they said is true. If you want to follow God, you follow me. You are wrong. His name was changed to Paul. And for the rest of his life, he lived out a mission of passion. But here's what he knows. You are going to be attacked from the outside. Let me bring clarity. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But you need to proceed with caution. The places where the church has thrived the most throughout history has been places where persecution is the underlying part of it. In Rome, in China, throughout the history of the world, whenever there was an attack, because you don't fake Christianity when it is against the law. It's only for the real people who say, I'm all in. But here's what you need to know. When you are attacked from the outside, the temptation will be to fight back. But the only way to win is actually to have them come to Christ. You may fight them on some level and think that you're doing well because you're trying to maintain a culture, but in reality, the only thing that wins a fierce wolf to Christ is grace. And if you come in trying to fight a battle on their terms, you will lose every time. The only way to win this battle is through grace because what they need is not a different perspective. What they need is Jesus. So it, play that out in your life. If you see someone that is in opposition to everything that you stand for, your only hope is grace. A couple years ago, we did a sermon series called The Enemies of Jesus. And we looked at who were the people that were always in opposition. And there was Pilate, and there was Herod. And we actually put the Apostle Paul in there. 
Because he started as an enemy, and the way that Jesus won the battle was grace. And it's the same thing true with us. But realize, there will be attacks from the outside. There's a secondary part there that I thought was interesting in his warning. He also warns that some of your own people will tell lies to win you over. Sometimes the fight comes from the outside, and sometimes it's from the inside. And in my observation of how this usually happens in churches, is that the conflict inside isn't with that fear and, and oppression. It usually comes with disunity, where the fight over the music style, or when the service is, or the way we do things, or how we read that scripture, or which translation we use, and those kinds of battles come into the church, and then there's disunity. You know what one of the, Jesus' final prayers was for the church? I pray that they would get along. He prayed that they would love each other because here's what he said. The world will know that I am who I say I am by how you love each other. So isn't it interesting? The only way to win the battle on the outside is grace. And since we're in church and we'll just talk about us for a second. The only way to win the battles inside the church is grace. Because there are people in here that don't agree with you. So what is our response? To fight or to love each other like Jesus loved us. I know I'm saying that to you, standing up here saying, let me tell you how Tuesday, I knew I was called to pray and didn't. I know the struggle. But this is what we are called to, to love each other well. I'm going to release to South Umqua and Green. There's a couple questions we want to challenge everyone with. I love you guys, and I'll see you soon. The questions that we have for you, number one, this comes back to this idea of the Holy Spirit. Where are you ignoring the Holy Spirit? Interestingly enough, you may be ignoring the Holy Spirit because you are listening to his warning and not listening to his calling. Where is it that he is calling you to move out? The second challenge isn't a question. It's a challenge. And it's one that you'll probably have to wrestle with. I have a friend who goes to church here at this campus. Uh, he sits right in the back, right back there uh, uh, during second service. He's one of the most godly men I've ever met. In our family, we call him the God Bubble because when you're around Jim Belmore, it feels like I'm in the presence of Jesus. Uh, Jim is a prayer warrior and loves people well. and um, It's a delight to come to this campus partly because I love to just see Jim. Well, he told me a story once on a Tuesday morning after prayer. Someone came up to him and said, Jim, how do you obey? And with two parts wisdom and one part annoyance, Jim responded, you do it. That's it. You do it. There's not a how-to. There's no manual. Do it. And here's our challenge for you, Jim's challenge, with zero part annoyance, but just the reality of this is what the biggest struggle we're always going to have. Will, you, will we, will I obey? So write that down. I want that word on there. Will I obey? When the Holy Spirit says go, do we go? When the Holy Spirit says pray for him when you don't like him, pray. Will I do what he said? That's the essence of being a follower of Jesus. When he says go, we hear it and we do it. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for grace because I need it. Because the very thing I'm supposed to speak on, I can't get through the week and not struggle with. God, I pray over us right now that as you speak to us with your Holy Spirit, you would give us a heart that says, I'll do what you've asked us to do. Love you, Jesus. I pray also that you would uh, work in the hearts of those who are, have moved off the mission you've called them to, and I pray that you would draw them back, that they would be willing to obey and live out something more significant than planning for and saving for retirement. In your name we pray. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.